walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you try to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. Joseph. Joseph, you know, he has this dream. You know, he's he has this really great dream, and he, it was so great he wanted to tell his brothers and his dad. He was like, hey, you know what? One day, I had this dream that I was going to be the ruler over y'all, 
And they didn't take that so well, right? You know, they really didn't like that. In fact, to the much that they didn't like it, that they ended up uh, doing some really bad things to them. But what I'm saying is that Joseph's dream didn't come true the next day or the next month. You know, in fact, he didn't even know that his dream was going to have some really stuff, bad stuff to happen. He was going to be thrown in a pit, took off the pit, sold into slavery, thrown into jail for years. And eventually, I think probably about 30-something years later, he ended up being second in command and his dream finally came. But throughout that time, God was taking him through a process. Amen. And then we can even look at the children of Israel. The children of Israel, they're in bondage. For 400 years, I mean, you would think they would be humble by then, right? For 400 years, they 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 have been enslaved by Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and they cry out to God, and God hears them, and He say, "You know what? I'm going to send Moses, my servant, and He's going to deliver them out of Egypt, and I'm going to take them into a promised land." What well, God takes, God uses Moses, He brings them out of the promised land, and they go into. I mean, he brings them out of bondage, and then he takes them into the promised land. No, that didn't happen like that. Why? Because God had to take them through a process, and the process lasted for 40 years. In fact, the majority of them didn't even make it because they couldn't take the process that was going on. I even look at David. David, he, he was anointed king at a very age, but he didn't become king the next day. It took time. God was taking them through a process while he was out in the field tending sheep fighting off lions and bears, you know, right. but eventually he became king. Uh, we can even go to the New Testament. The New Testament, we have Paul. He was a persecutor of Christians. He was, you know, just, just killing Christians, you know, persecuting him. On the road to Damascus, he has this big vision. Jesus knocks him off his high horse. He gets converted. He's a Christian right then, but he didn't preach for three years. Why? Because God was taking him process. So what I want to convey to you today is that God is always taking us through a process. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to chapter 6 of Mark, and I want to read something to you. Chapter 6 of Mark, and uh, I'm going to be reading out the NLT version, and I uh, hope that's okay. Uh, but while you're doing it, I'm just going to pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this uh, word. Thank you for this time, God. I pray, God, that you would just open up hearts and minds, God, and that your word would just... Uh, just flow, Lord, that it will take root in our hearts, multiply, and be fruitful in our lives in Jesus' name. In Mark chapter 6, verse 45, and it reads, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills and prayed. Verse 45 really spoke volumes to me because he said, it said immediately after this, Jesus insisted. Now that word insisted, if we were to look at it in the King James, it says constrained, constrained. So basically it said that Jesus constrained his disciples to get back in the boat. And I'm a type of person, you know, when I start seeing words, you know, word plays, you know, a lot of times I go into the Hebrew and Greek. So I actually looked up the word constrained in the Greek and the word is pronounced anakazo. And it means to necessitate or compel. Uh, it also means to uh, force, to drive, to require, to push, to push, to pressure, to restrict, to limit, to curb, to check, to restrain. But I want to go back to necessitate and compel. So Jesus felt it necessary that the disciples get back in the boat. All, all the way to the point that he was like, you know, to some degree, like tapping him on the shoulder, like, come on, you need to get in the boat. Yeah. We need to go, you know. And, and I thought about that, like, why? why? I mean, why Jesus was so uh, dogmatic or with this sense of urgency for the disciples to get back in the boat? Well, I'm glad you asked. It was because they had to go to the other side. Mm -hmm. See, if you go with me to verse 53, it says, After they had crossed the lake, they landed at Genesaret, they brought the boat to shore, and they climbed out. The people recognized Jesus at once, and they ran throughout the whole area, carrying sick people on mats. So wherever they heard he was, wherever he went, in villages, in cities, or in the countryside, they brought the sick out to the marketplace, and they begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe. And all who touched him were healed. See, when they got to the other side, the blind was able to see. When they got to the other side, the lame was able to 
uh, walk. The mute was able to yes. speak. The deaf was able to hear. People was getting liberal. People was getting a breakthrough. Revival broke out on the other yes. side, but it didn't happen until they got there. Amen? Amen. Because God was calling them to the other side. And on the other side, there are divine appointments to be fulfilled. Divine appointment. What's a divine appointment? A meet set up by God. That's, That's what it is. Right. And I look at these guys. These guys are in the boat. And guess what? They're heading to the yeah, other side. side. Yeah. Because on the other side, the divine appointments are going to be fulfilled when they oh, get yeah. there. Amen. They just got to wait. They just got to stay in the boat. Yeah. Amen. Amen. As long as they stay in the boat, they're going to be okay. Now, we do have people, unfortunately, get out of the boat. You know, And I just thought to myself, what if Peter... You know, tap the shoulder of John and say, hey, John, you know, I kind of liked it on the other side where we was at. I'm going to get out and, and swim back. And I don't think they would have made it, you know. And thank God that some people do make it back, you know what I'm saying? But it's very necessary that you stay in the boat and you go to the other side. But how many people know when you begin to go to the other side, opposition is going to come, oh, right? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Now, if you go with me to verse 47, it says, late that night, same chapter, the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble. He saw that they were rowing hard. He saw that they were struggling against the wind at the waves. About 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but they saw him walking on the water. They cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. See, as the disciples began to go to the other side, they're in this boat, and as they're taking their journey, opposition came. It says that they was in serious trouble. See, maybe it's somebody in some serious trouble in here today. I don't know. Then it say they was rowing hard. Maybe you just find it hard. You know, like, life is just hard. I just can't take it anymore. I'm tired of living like this. And then it say they were str struggling. Maybe you're just struggling. Struggling with different situations in your life. I don't know what it is, but we need to do what the disciples did. Now, it, the scripture says that they cried out and hermeneutically, we know that they cried out because they thought Jesus was a ghost. Right. Now, I look at that word ghost, and that word ghost is a direct reference to the word spirit. And when you look at spirit, I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the spirit that leaves a person when they die. So basically, they looked at Jesus, and they thought Jesus was dead. He, 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 they're they're going to die. They're in the middle of this lake and all this storm is coming and Jesus is a spirit now. It's nothing he can do for us. He's somewhere off in the Bolivian. But I want to let you know that Jesus responded. He responded after they cried out. He said, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Yes, and that's what I want to convey to, to you all today that God is saying, take courage. Don't be afraid. He is here. Even though it may seem like he's not, and maybe you don't see him like in the physical form, but I know he's here. God has done so many things in my life that I can testify that I knew if it, it, it had to be God. It just had to be God. If it wasn't God, it wouldn't have happened. That's exactly you know, right. And that's what God wants us to realize, that he's here for us. He's here for us. Now, if you will, if you turn with me to John 6, we have this same story going on. If I can get my my Bible, right? Because, okay, yeah, John. Go to John 6, and we have the same story in John 6. John 6, starting at verse 16. Verse 16. And it reads, That evening Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still had not come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Soon a, uh, a gale swept down upon them, and the sea grew very rough. They had rowed three or four miles, when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified, but he called out to them, Don't be afraid, I am here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. I just love that, that that last part. It says they were eager to let Jesus in their boat. They was willing to let Jesus in their yes. boat. See, we got to be eager and willingly to let him in our boat. Right. God is not a pushover. He's not going to force his way upon us. We have to be willingly to accept him into our lives. And once they did that, it said that, that, that they arrived at their, their destination. But one thing I want you to realize is, is once Jesus come into the boat, we're no longer the captain. Right. We're not the captain anymore. Jesus Amen. becomes the captain. Amen. Now, what do we become, though? We become the deckhand. 
Yeah, we become the dickhead. Jesus is the stirrer. We are the paddlers. Okay, Jesus is in charge, and he's going to take us to our destination. But how many people know that there is a process? Amen. There is a process in this thing. And I want to talk about that process as I begin to close. If you turn with me to Luke 24. Luke 24. Now, this story is actually uh, called the walk to uh, the walk to Emus, or uh, Emus, however you want to say, say it. But uh, basically, you know, the, you know, just the backdrop of it is that that Jesus just actually died. He died, but he also resurrected. And you have these two disciples uh, who actually don't know that he's, you know, came back to life, and they're kind of sad, and they're walking, and they're like. Man, I can't believe this happened. You know, they're sad. They feel bad. And and, and and all of a sudden, Jesus appears walking with them. But but they don't know it's Jesus because he made it in a way that he made them look like somebody else. So, so I'm just going to pick up right here at verse uh, 17. This is when Jesus appears to them. He's In uh, verse 17, it says, in chapter 24, it says, He asked them, which is Jesus, What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short of sadness, written really across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who, 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 uh, who, who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in the last few days. What things, Jesus asked? The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth. They said he was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and our religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We, we had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of the followers were at his tomb, and early this morning they came back with an amazing report. They said that his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of, our, some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the woman had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the rites of Moses and the prophets, explained from all the scriptures, um, the things concerning himself. By this time, they were near Emus, and they at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on, but but they begged him, say, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them, and as he sat down to eat, he took the bread, he blessed it, then he broke it, then he gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were open, they recognized him. At that moment, he disappeared. There's four things that I really want to like project to you as I'm getting ready to close is that if you notice, you know, Jesus went through them with all the scriptures, telling them about himself, basically, you know, who he was. And they got to the to the end of their journey. And as they was going to walk on, Jesus was going to go another way. But they was like, no, please come. Please come with us. Spend the night with us. Spend the night with us. Stay with us tonight. You know, they was compelled because he was just telling all these beautiful things that he had just said. And he sat down at the table, and he did four things that I truly believe that is like like something that he really done in my life. And I kind of believe like it was kind of like with his own life. It was kind of like a deal with his own life. But at the same time, it's something that he do in all lives. And if you notice, it says that, so when they went home and as they sat down to eat, he took the bread. See, just as Jesus took their bread, that's how he takes our lives. And he takes us just as we are. You know, I don't have to clean myself up good enough. I talk to friends back in Georgia all the time about getting their lives right and that Jesus loved them. Well, man, you know what? I'm going to stop drinking first and then I'm going to come. Yeah. Or I'm going to stop smoking weed first then I'm going to come. Or let me get married first. Or uh, I'm about to have a kid. You know, no, Jesus will take you just like he took the yeah. bread just as you are. Yeah. But see, after he took the bread, it says he blessed it. Because see, Jesus <laughs> just don't want to take your life. He wants to bless your yeah. life. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. He wants to bless your life. In fact, there's a scripture, Ephesians, I think, Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Amen. He's already blessed us with spiritual blessings. 
in Proverbs it says, the blessing of the Lord make of one rich and he adds no sorrow to That's it. Exactly Jesus right. wants to bless us, but right. we have to take, he, he has to take us first. He wants to take us, he wants to bless us. But then there's another part of this process that nobody really likes, like this is the hard part. Because see, after he blessed it, he broke it. See, Jesus uh -huh. wants to break you. Yeah. Yep. Jesus yeah. wants to break your life. And I don't mean break you literally like a pencil in half, but he wants yeah. to humble you. Yeah. That's yeah. what he wants to do. He wants to humble you. Why? Because yeah. even David said it, and she was reading this morning, that a broken and a contrite spirit, yeah. you would not turn away. Okay. Because see, Jesus yeah. wants to humble us. If, if, if we're not humble, he can't use us. He can't yeah. use us. If we're prideful, he can't yeah. use us. And see, and if he can't break us, the last part of this process can't take place because see, after he broke it, he gave it to him. See, Jesus wants to give you away. He wants to give you away to something great. He wants yeah. to give you to be uh, a missionary in Africa. Uh, he wants to give you to be that five fortune uh, owner at a business. He wants to give you to be an intern at Team Challenge. He wants Ooh. to give you to be a pastor. He wants to give you away to something great, but he, he wants to give you back to your family. But guess what? He's not going to give you back to your family if, if you ain't went through the broken process. Now, we do have people who try to go back and give themselves away, and that doesn't work, and it okay. ends up being a train wreck worse than it was before. Yes. So we, we, we let, just let Jesus take you, let him bless you, let him break you, and let him give you away to something great. But it's a process. It's a process. And I'm going to end on this last scripture. There's a scripture in Proverbs, it's 12.1 in the NLT version. It says, to learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. Let me read that again. To learn, you must love <laughs> discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. What I have came to the realization is that nobody really truly loves discipline. Let's be honest. Do we really like discipline? I mean, you know, and, and for, even in my own life, you know, I don't really like discipline, you know what I'm saying? But I love the effects of discipline, don't we? We like the effects of it. Like, you know, I mean, it's not hard to tell. I know I'm overweight. And my mom gets on me about it all the time, trust me. And I, you know, but and I even got a Planet Fitness uh, membership. And I probably went like four months ago. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you know, it just, because I love food, you know? And so it's like, I don't want to get up and I don't want to exercise. I don't want to get on a treadmill. I don't want to lift weights. I don't want to do all this stuff. But I love the effects of me if I would have done it, you know. And it's the same thing with these guys. I know in the process, sometimes you don't like Team Challenge and, and, and you don't really agree with some of the stuff that we do there. But you're going to love the effects of it if you're just hanging out. Oh, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank, thank you all very much. I just want to have a prayer. Maybe the pastor want to come up and say something in with a prayer. But uh, as she's coming up, I just want to thank y'all for allowing Team Challenge to come speak to y'all today and share our testimonies and our word. And you know, it just, it's just been a really great time here. Thank y'all so much, and I hope y'all invite us back. Amen. 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 Amen.
And we, I'm going to ask you today, do you know Jesus? You say, I knew about him, but I didn't know him at the time. If someone asks me today, are you saved? I can say, yes, I'm saved. I know Jesus. And the Bible says in the book of Romans 10, chapter 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts, then we shall be saved. With the mouth believes unto righteousness, and with the heart man is faith unto to salvation. So I'm going to ask you today, with no one looking around, because I want to give you opportunity today. I'm not asking you to join the church or to go to a particular church. I'm asking you today to invite you to salvation through Jesus Christ through a prayer, a simple prayer. I'm just going to ask you to do one with no one looking around. Every head bow and no one looking around. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. If you're not sure that you're saved, just lift your hand before the Lord. The Lord sees those hands. He sees those hands in the house. And the only thing we can do is to come to Jesus just as we are. Like he said, he takes you as you are. If we could fix ourselves up, my friend, we wouldn't need Jesus. So because we can't fix ourselves up, because we cannot cleanse our own sins because we can't make it to heaven without him. I'm going to ask you to say this prayer with me right now. Everyone in the house I'm going to ask you to say the prayer together. And if you said it for the first time, you're going to know in your own heart that you're saved. No one's going to have to tell you. You're going to know. Because when Jesus saved me, no one had to ask me, am I sure that I was saved? I knew I was saved. Because you're going to know because something is going to happen to you on the inside of your heart and your life. So I want you to say this prayer out loud, everyone in the house, Lord Jesus. I believe you are the Son of God. I ask you now to forgive me of my sin. To cleanse me of your blood. To come and live in my heart. Write my name in your book in heaven. Lord Jesus, I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and your power to live for you all the days of my life. Now, Lord Jesus, right now, I thank you that I am saved. Amen. My friend, if you said that prayer for the first time today, you are saved and you have your name written in heaven. And you're going to know that you have a place Amen. eternally with Christ Jesus, my daddy. What I would, I would instruct you to do is to get you a Bible and start reading the Word of God every day. Uh, just um, um, That's going to teach you about what God's Word says. It tells us what, you know, all about Him and about us and our relationship with Him. It will instruct you each day. It will direct you each day of your life. And that will build your prayer life. Prayer is our communication with God and God communicates with us. Amen. Again, I want to say it's been an honor and a pleasure to have these young men here today and hear the testimony. I remember my husband. He's with the Lord today.